Well, if you have your Bibles, um, in just a few moments we'll be reading from Psalm 23. I've already said that we're continuing our uh, series looking at the names that the Lord Jesus Christ has in Scripture. There are many, many of them. I think I have a list that's uh, at least a hundred long, um, and there are probably more that, uh, that I've overlooked. Um, so this series could go on for quite a while, and, and that's great, um, because it's so good to look at the Lord Jesus Christ as he is presented to us in these names. And um, last year, about this time, we were looking at the name of Emmanuel, and I couldn't imagine how that could possibly be a suitable topic for a New Year's sermon. Uh, but I'd exhausted all of the possible New Year's messages that I could think of at that point. So I thought, well, I'll preach on Emmanuel anyway. And then I discovered that knowing that God is with us is a wonderful New Year's message. And uh, it's the same with the Good Shepherd. On the face of it, you may not think it's a great topic to, to launch a new year with, but when you start to think about it, there isn't a better subject that we could be looking at than knowing that the Lord is our shepherd and he's leading us forward um, into this new year. Uh, it's a name that he gave to himself in John chapter 10 and verse 11. He says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Straight away, he's telling us his qualifications to have that name. He's not like other shepherds who don't care for the sheep, just run away when they, the sheep come into danger. He is one who went to the cross and shed his blood and laid down his life in order to purchase these sheep back to himself. It's an amazing uh, demonstration of love, of compassion, of mercy. And when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, we become his sheep. We become a part of his flock. It's a little bit of a test of our pride right there because um, sheep aren't known for being the most intelligent of animals. Um, quite the contrary. Um, and sometimes we sort of think, well, I'm not sure I want to be called a sheep. Doesn't sound very complimentary, does it? Well, live with it, as they say, because we are pretty foolish, and it's a very good description for us. But also, of course, it defines for us this relationship that we have as sheep with the good shepherd. And I was thinking, well, what can we learn about Jesus from the name the Good Shepherd? And uh, the way to find out, of course, the way to learn about him is to see how it is that he treats his sheep. And there's no better place to look and see how he treats his sheep than the 23rd Psalm. It's a psalm that uh, just about everybody knows whether they're in the church or not in the church. And when people get into times of difficulty or they draw near to the grave, this is the passage of Scripture. If they know any Scripture at all, this is the one that they will call to mind. This is the one that they will read. And it's not surprising because there is so much comfort and blessing here. And uh, God willing, we're going to draw comfort and blessing out of it uh, today and Lord willing ne next week. Let's just read the psalm through together to begin with. We're not going to do all of it this morning. Um, my intention is that we'll just look at the first three verses and then we'll take the remainder next week. But the psalm is so rich 
Um, I don't want to just read a part of it. So let's read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And all I really want us to do in these two messages is to admire our Lord Jesus Christ and God willing to fall more deeply in love with him and to bask in what it means to us and what it ought to mean to us as we enter this new year that Jesus is our shepherd. And although I don't want to exclude the fact that some of the blessings spoken of in this psalm have a physical component, I do think that most of what is being spoken of here is spiritual, and that's where I'm going to focus our attention this morning. Uh, after all, uh, Peter in 1 Peter 2.25, does introduce Jesus to us as the one who is the shepherd of our souls, our spiritual shepherd. You were continually straying like sheep, he says, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. And at the very beginning of the psalm, there is this expression that I think sets the tone for the whole of it. And that is that if, if we are sheep of this shepherd, we shall not lack. The Lord is my shepherd. And our version says, I shall not want. Now I've added a few extras up on the screen there for a very good reason. The first is when... People who are unfamiliar with the psalm or with some of the hymns sing that hymn or read it, you know, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. They turn it round in their heads and think, well, the Lord's a shepherd I don't want. And it doesn't mean he's not a shepherd that we want. He's a shepherd who we'd rather keep away from. It means the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I will have no need no needs. He will take care of all my needs. And uh, although it says I shall not want, um, it could just as easily be uh, presented as I do not want. If the Lord is your shepherd this morning, you do not have need because he will take care of all of that. There is no lack for the sheep of this shepherd in 2015. And there won't be any lack if he spares you in 2016, 17, 2050. Because if you are his sheep, his sheep lack for nothing. And how could it be otherwise? If God sent his son into the world, if Jesus Christ laid down his life for you to buy you back to himself, 
Could it be so that he could abandon you and just leave you to poke around on some piece of wasteland and scrape out a living, starving, thirsty? Could that be? Could he have sent Jesus to the cross to treat you that way? It's just unthinkable. That's what Paul says in, in Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He gave us the most precious thing, if you like, that he had, the most precious person to him. He gave us Jesus. He can't hold anything back if that is the extent of his love for us. The rest of the psalm is going to expand on that, and that's how we're going to look at it. How is it exactly that if we are his sheep, we have no needs, we have no lack? And we're going to consider that our souls shall not, shall not lack food or safety or rest, that our souls shall not lack nurture or drink, that our souls shall not lack correction and guidance, that our souls shall not lack tender leadership. And then we'll take a look at why it is uh, that the Lord treats us this way as our shepherd. But before we get into that, let me just ask you, believers here this morning, this question. Do you think of yourself this morning as somebody who has no needs? Talking spiritually. Do you think of yourself as someone who has such a shepherd watching over you, caring for you, providing for you, that you lack for nothing today? There couldn't be more that you could have because he's taking care of it all and you lack no good thing. I think if we, if we were able to get into that mindset, which is very biblical, it would change the way we live. It would change the way we think about ourselves and, and our lives. Um, so let's pray that the Lord might do that for us as we look at these things together now. Firstly then, if we have the Lord as our shepherd, our souls shall not lack food or safety or rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures, says the psalmist. The good shepherd provides abundant sustenance, food for our souls. He doesn't come to us with junk food, spiritually speaking, because he loves us, because he desires the best for us, and only the best is going to be good enough for the sheep of this shepherd. These are the ones he laid down his life for. He's shown how much he loves us. He's going to give us the best food. And that's how it's described. Green pastures, tender and new. You know, the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ is spoken of in the last words of David in 2 Samuel 23 and, and then in Psalm 72. It's going to be like tender grass springing up out of the ground after uh, after rain, after those showers of blessing we've been reading about. And that's the food that we're going to have to eat, that we do have to eat for our souls. It's not dried stuff. It's not pellets. It's not scratching around, hoping, you know, I was, we were just reading, weren't we, about Ahab and, and what happened in the in the famine at the time of Elijah and how they went through the whole land just looking for a little bit of green stuff for the livestock. It's not going to be like that. 
if you are a sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is it that God has provided for you in order to feed your soul? It's his word, isn't it? It's his word. So think about that for a moment. He's given you his word. And his word is supposed to be green pasture for your soul. And then notice two things about uh, the sheep lying down in these pastures. First, they are safe. I did a little bit of research on the internet and I came across um, a site where somebody who was a shepherd was writing about sheep. It wasn't in the context of Psalm 23. And he said, as far in his experience, sheep will never lie down when they have fear, any fear. They won't lie down. And so the fact that we lie down, that, that David here says, he makes me lie down, it's a picture of safety. In these green pastures, in, in this word that he supplied. It's a place of safety. Well, how does that work? Well, the Word of God teaches us. The Word of God guides us. It warns us. It corrects us. It equips us. It sanctifies us. It trains us. And you can't be safe as a sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ if you're not instructed, if you're not guided, if you put that on one side and say, I'll be just fine without the word and without that guidance, and I don't need to be warned or corrected, I'll find my own way, thank you very much. And I don't need to be equipped and I don't need to be sanctified. You're not in a safe place, are you? But he's given us this word as food for our souls and it's a place where we can be safe if we will eat of this word. And second, these sheep, the ones like David who lie down in the green pastures, they're at rest. They are at rest. And we're to rest in the word of God. Think about it. We're to take time in it. We're to repose in it. He makes me lie down in this grass. He doesn't make me pass through. I'm thinking when they put in the high-speed train uh, somewhere down, if they get round to it, somewhere down California, you're probably going to pass through some pasture land at about 185 miles an hour. Uh, you can do that in Europe on their high-speed trains right now. <laughs> Well, that's not how we're supposed to be with the Word of God. Whoosh! Well, that was interesting. Whatever it was, went by so fast, hardly know. No, no, no. We're supposed to lie down. What do sheep do when they lie down in green pasture, having eaten of it? They chew the cud. Thank you. Absolutely right. And that takes time. They're going to derive all the benefit that there is in this word. It's not going to be uh, just gulping it down and then on to the next thing. They're going to chew the cud. They're going to meditate on it. They're going to uh, delight in it. And they're going to take time in it. And as they do that, in the word they will see the heart of love of this shepherd and when you see Jesus in his heart of love for you, can't you rest in him? And when you chew the cud of his word, you start to appreciate his great and his precious promises. Can't you rest in those? They are very great and they are very precious. So here in this word is a place where we can rest no matter what is going on round about us. 
That is what Jesus intends for us. That's what he says in Matthew 11. You know this passage. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Where are you going to learn from Jesus, by the way? In his word, isn't it? Learn from me, and then what will happen? I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's what he wants us to know. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. There's only tribulation and difficulty for us out in the world. But our good shepherd has overcome the world. John 16, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I've overcome the world. So here's the question for us this morning. Do you lie down in this pasture? Do you? Um, reading the Bible together is great. I really love that program. I'm so glad we're doing it together as a fellowship. And if you're not doing that, but you're doing something else, a Bible in a year program or whatever, those things are great. Provided that we're not just reading it for the say-so. Provided it's not a high-speed train thing. Okay, up in the morning, five minutes, read the word, got that done. Next, brush my teeth. We have to dwell in this word. We have to lie down in it. We have to digest it. Chew the cud. There is so much good for our souls that he has supplied. If only we will take the time. Uh, to meditate upon it. So that's the first thing. Our souls shall not lack food or safety or rest. Next, our souls shall not lack nurture or drink. He leads me, says David, beside quiet waters. If we continue the diet analogy, our good shepherd does not give us soda pop to drink. Nor does he give us stagnant and festering, stinking water that uh, makes us wretch when we get close to it. Nor does he give us troubled, churning waters like the ocean. No. We drink from quiet waters. Not stagnant, but not churning and troubled either. These are still waters, sweet waters. And again, the emblem here is of peace and of calm. And that again, that there is no drink to compare with this. You may be sure of that because of who the good shepherd is. Nothing but the best for the sheep of this shepherd. You know that's true. It could not be any other way. And so he leads us to these best of waters. And what is the spiritual water that he has given us as sheep? that we may drink from it. It is the Holy Spirit. As Jesus said in John 4, verse 14, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. By laying down his life for us, Jesus purchased the Holy Spirit to come into us and to be a down payment, guaranteeing all of the blessings 
uh, that are ours in Christ, working in us to quicken us, to refresh us, to revive us, and to produce the fruit of peace in our hearts. And this is not a noisy, bustling place. These waters aren't noisy and bustling. They're quiet waters. You know, so many places that want you to believe they have the Holy Spirit today are full of noise and bustle and confusion. And people saying, yeah, isn't that great? That's the Spirit for you. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Remember what we were reading in 1 Kings when Elijah was going to meet with the Lord? And he comes out the second time uh, to, to meet the Lord. And there's this tremendous wind so strong that it's tearing the rocks of the mountains apart. Pretty dramatic stuff. Was God in the wind? No. And the next thing that came along was an earthquake. I don't know how he kept his footing, but all the ground around him, tremendous upheaval. Tremendous demonstration of the power of God. Was God in the earthquake? No. And then there was a fire. I wonder how scorching the heat of that fire was. Was God in the fire? No. And then there came this gentle breathing, or as some translations have it, a still, small voice. And that's when Elijah knew that God had come to meet with him. Not in this outward spectacle of, of amazing power, but in a still, small voice. And that is very often the way that the Spirit of God will work. He is still and quiet waters for us. Well, where is this place? Where is it that the Good Shepherd leads his sheep that they may drink these waters? Well, it is wherever his word is read and preached. It is wherever his people draw near to him in prayer. It is wherever we enjoy Christ as he reveals himself to us in our fellowship together. We see Christ being formed in a brother or a sister and it's living water to our souls. It's refreshing. It's blessing. It's grace to us. It's wherever we commune with the Lord Jesus Christ at his table. And he reveals himself to us in all his love, in all his beauty. And we're refreshed and blessed. It's whenever we, re we reflect on all the things that baptism signs and, and seals to us. Our union with the Lord Jesus Christ that can never be broken. It's in the means of grace. That's where we may drink our fill of these living waters and be refreshed. So our shepherd gently leads us there. He leads us to these places of quiet and of rest where we may drink the living water. And we should follow him there. If we really want to drink of this living water, we should follow him. John 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So are you following him this morning? And if so, how closely? Are you following him as he calls you to come and drink of this living water? Let's pledge ourselves. Will you do this? Let's pledge ourselves in the year 2015 to drink more deeply of this living water than we did in 2014 and perhaps than we have ever done before. If you're still thirsty, it's not his fault because the living water is here and there's plenty for us all. We can never 
drink to the bottom of these waters. And so here, taking these last two points together, here are the food and the drink that our good shepherd gives to his sheep, his word and his spirit and all that comes with them. And you know, they always go together, the word and the spirit. It's the spirit who writes the law of God on our hearts. It's the spirit who works to sanctify us. And how does he do that? Jesus says, sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. Whenever the Spirit works, it is in the environment of the Word. And as a result, if you're His sheep this morning, you should be enjoying safety, rest, nurture, refreshment, and peace. Is it any wonder that the psalmist says, I do not want. I do not want. What more could you ask for than this? Well, we go on because there is more that we can learn about our lacking lack, our complete lack of need in the Lord Jesus Christ because we shall not lack correction and guidance. Here is a word of tremendous comfort to us. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. Because what happens when we don't eat and drink as we should? What happens when we don't follow the lead of this shepherd as closely as we ought? What happens when we wander away from him? And you know it can happen. I know it can happen. It does happen. The psalmist knows it can happen. Remember two weeks ago we were looking at at Psalm 119 verse 176 where the psalmist having praised and delighted in the law of God throughout that psalm says, I have gone astray like a sheep, like a lost sheep. Seek your servant for I do not forget your commandments. So what happened to him and what happens to us if we do go astray? Is that the end for us? Does he abandon us? Does he cut us out of the flock and say, well, that was a bit of a waste of time. I'm not going to bother with that sheep anymore. Silly sheep. After all that I've done and after the food that I've provided and after this drink that I've given and it's the best that they could possibly have and then they wander off. Forget it. No, he doesn't do that. He turns us back to himself. He seeks us out and he turns us back. Luke 15, verse 4. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? That's why it says here in the psalm, he restores our souls. He restores my soul. Because that word restore has to do with turning back. Uh, It's very closely linked to the idea of repentance. He turns us back to himself. Back into the good way. Back into these paths of righteousness and that is what uh, the psalmist knew and how does how does he do it though how does he turn us back well he does it through the word and through the spirit that's what he's telling us here and uh, look at uh, psalm 19 verse 7 you, you'll know this verse very well The law of the Lord, his word, right? The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Restores the soul. Same word. Turns the soul back to God. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
This is what the, the Word and the Spirit do for us when we're stupid enough to wander away from such a shepherd and from, from such food and drink. He doesn't leave us to the wolves and dismiss us as a lost cause. He comes out and he turns us back to himself. And, and our psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 176, knew this as well. I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. Why and how? I do not forget your commandments. There's the place of safety. There's the place where the Spirit dwells and works. And he works repentance and he works restoration for us when we wander off. So if that's you this morning, if you've wandered off from the Lord, if your heart has grown cold towards Him, if you've left your first love somewhere behind in the past, then the way back is here in Psalm 23. And Jesus is seeking you this morning. Let him lead you. Let him lead you to the way back, the green pastures, the quiet waters, the Word and the Spirit, which he's given us as food and drink for our souls. Well, one last thing that we'll look at, uh, showing how we lack for nothing as the sheep of this shepherd, is that our souls shall not lack tender leadership. And this looks back into verses 2 and verse 3. And it shows the heart that our shepherd has for us as his sheep. Because the word that's translated leads in verse 2, and the one that's translated guides in verse 3, although they are not the same word, they are very similar in their meaning. And both have this idea of tremendous care. Both have this idea of gentleness, gently leading, tenderly guiding, guiding in the right way. And this is the kind of leading and guiding that any shepherd ought to have for his sheep. But the good shepherd has them in abundance for his sheep. Look at Isaiah 40 and verse 11. We had it for our meditation. Here's the heart. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs. Have you got that mental picture? You lambs in the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to feel so thrilled about this. He gathers you up. He's got you in his arms. He carries them in his bosom, holds them close, that place of tremendous love and safety and, and comfort. And he gently leads the nursing ewes. And, and gently lead there. That's the same word as we have in verse 2 in Psalm 23. He leads me beside quiet waters. It's gentle. It's loving, it's tender, it's caring, it's kind-hearted. And he knows each one of us. He knows the ones who can't be driven too hard and must be allowed uh, some rest. He knows the ones who need more care, who need more protection. What a shepherd. This is your shepherd, believer. Your shepherd this morning. That's how much he loves you. Well, why does he treat us this way then? Why should he? Why does this shepherd 
do this for us? Why are we so wonderfully provided for and blessed? Why is it that we lack for nothing as his sheep? Why has he given us the word and the spirit? Why does he carefully, gently lead us and guide us, turn us back to himself? Why does he provide for us this safety and this rest? Well, the answer is in the psalm. He does it for his name's sake. Because he staked his reputation on you if you're his child this morning. He has staked his reputation on you. He's put his name upon you. What will happen to his name if even one of his sheep starves and doesn't make it to glory? What will happen to his name if one of his sheep is savaged by wolves? What will happen to his name if just one sheep wanders off and can't be found and brought back into the fold. He purchased us. He laid down his life for us. He brought us into his fold. And he bound himself to us to be our shepherd. And it doesn't matter, and don't get me wrong in what I'm about to say, it doesn't matter how silly we are. It doesn't matter how stupidly we behave. And we shouldn't be silly, and we shouldn't behave stupidly as the sheep of this shepherd. But if we do, and when we do, he must save. He must come out after us. He must bring us back. He must because he's not going to lose one of those that the Father has given to him. He's staked his honor on it. He's staked his reputation on it. And that is too much to have at stake for him to do anything other than to make sure that all who are his sheep will infallibly be saved, will make it to glory. That is why He treats us this way. His great love for us. His love for his Father. The honor of his name. Let's just say a few words by way of conclusion. First to the believer, take a good look at your shepherd this morning. How he loves you. I don't think we think about that enough. It trots off our lips so easily, doesn't it? Sometimes it's just a bumper sticker. Jesus loves you. And we think, yeah, right. Jesus loves you. If you're his sheep this morning, he loves you. He rescued you from sin and from Satan, from death, from hell. And now that you are his sheep, think about how gently he has been leading you and guiding you, not driving you on harder and faster than you can bear, cares for you, feeds you with this green pasture, gives you this still, quiet water uh, to drink, how he cares for you. But you need to understand that if there is a good shepherd, then there are bad shepherds too. There are the ones that Jesus called mere hired hands. The ones who don't lead us into places that are good for our souls, but places of danger, places of turmoil, noise, confusion. Places of spiritual barrenness and famine. Places of drought. And so the question is, how closely are you following Jesus this morning, this shepherd? Have you wandered off after some other shepherd who doesn't care two pins for your soul and for your eternal state? Well, if you have begun to wander, if you have begun to grow cold, 
Turn back to him. Have your soul restored in his word by his spirit. Eat the green pasture and drink the quiet waters in 2015. Unbelievers, I don't know who you are following this morning, but I do know who you are not following. You're not following the Good Shepherd. And you might be making a very good effort to make other people think that you're following the Good Shepherd, but it's not really working all that well for you, is it? Because you're empty inside, you're aching. You want this green pasture and you want this quiet water, but you can't have them outside of Christ. You can't have them unless you're a member of his flock. And so like the prodigal son, you're off trying to fill up your stomach with pig's food, trying to satisfy your soul with that stuff, junk, soda pop. And it's not working, is it? Of course it isn't. How could you ever think? that you could satisfy your soul with those things. When Jesus went to the cross to make these green pastures and these quiet waters available, and those are the only things that can satisfy you with rest and with peace, that can nourish you, that can cause you to grow. And there you are trying to fill up your stomach, the stomach of your soul, as it were, on pig's food. Well, you need to understand that as long as you keep doing that, you're going to continue to keep feeling empty. You're going to continue to keep aching. You're going to continue to keep fearing. You're going to continue to feel lost. But you don't have to do that because there is a good shepherd and he's not about to turn anyone away who comes to him and turns away from their sin and just cast themselves upon him for salvation. He won't turn you away. Why won't you come to him? Come to him to be your good shepherd this morning and follow him as he leads you to these green pastures and guides you to the quiet waters. Are you hearing his voice calling you this morning? His sheep hear his voice and he knows them and they follow him. Isn't it about time that some of you here this morning who've been holding out so long while this good shepherd has been calling you, isn't it about time that you follow him and that you put your trust in him? Eat this pasture. Drink this living water. Great way to start the new year with a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, please draw near.